Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It was early August of 2006. I know this because I'm a school teacher, and this was my last quick trip before having to go back to work. I live in Sacramento and drove up to the Tahoe area. I had heard about an area I could go to find Bigfoot tracks, and if I could, see one. A friend was supposed to have joined me, but canceled at the last minute. Determined, I headed out. I arrived at the trailhead, parked, and began what was supposed to be a full day hike into the mountains. The hike was amazing at first, but as the day turned into night, I realized this hike would take me longer as I hadn't factored in hiking up huge mountains and the fact I was going over land, not on an improved trail. By my calculations, I had gone a solid eight to nine miles and was worn out. I was in decent shape, but the full pack and constant climbing uphill were taking it out of me. When the sun was closing in on the horizon and darkness was beginning to take hold, I decided to just camp until first light and continue on the last few miles then. The weather for the area called for clear skies, so I didn't even bother to set up my tent, instead deciding on just sleeping on the ground with my sleeping bag. I didn't even bother with a fire. I was tired, and all I wanted to do was sleep. I was out within minutes of closing my eyes. I'm not sure what time it was, but I was woken early. It was dark out, versus when I had fallen asleep under an almost full moon. I wasn't sure what had woken me, but I lay there and listened. It was dark and quiet. I rolled over to go back to sleep when I heard what sounded like someone walking close by. I was alert instantly. I couldn't believe it. Was there a Sasquatch just outside my campsite? Was this going to be this easy? I was excited and also a bit terrified. I was all alone and eight or so miles away from anyone. I lay there and heard the footsteps for about 15 minutes or so, and then it got quiet again. I eventually fell back to sleep. I woke with the sun, packed, and went to the spot to see if I could find any tracks. Nothing. Not a darn one. I swore I'd heard what I thought was a bipedal creature walking. I searched and searched, but found nothing. Resigned to the fact I wasn't going to find a track, I set off for my original spot. I reached it by mid-morning and set up my camp, tent and all. After, I went hiking around to look for any signs. When I returned in the midday, I found my campsite had been visited. My pack was outside my tent and the content all over the ground. My food was opened and some of it missing, but I wasn't too upset. As right near where I had set up a firing was a large print. I took a photo with my camera and went to look for more. I had succeeded in finding a track. I went to go get my plaster, but the bag was torn and its contents spread all over the backside of the campsite. Not deterred, 
I took more photos. As I cleaned up the site, I was a bit unsettled that the creature had invaded my space. Then again, was it really my space? I was in their territory, not vice versa. I picked up what was left of my food and discovered that it hadn't left me much to get through the next two days. I'd have to ration or head back early. It was then I saw a trail left by literal crumbs of granola. I followed it and found the wrapping paper. I then saw another wrapper further down. I kept going, wrapper after wrapper, until I had found a well-worn trail, clearly highly trafficked. It was north and south. Around it were the telltale signs of a Sasquatch. Snapped and bent trees, all made into angles and even a stack of rocks next to a split trail. Curious. I followed the trail down for a ways. It ended near a large rock formation, and to my right, I saw an opening to a cave. I took a step, then froze. What on earth was I thinking, I thought? Was I really going to go into what was most likely a Sasquatch lair? I still had my camera and an opportunity to get photos of where a Sasquatch lives. This was my moment. I pushed my fear aside and stepped up to the entrance. Just before I took another step, I saw a pile of bones just off the entrance, near the base of a large pine. At first, I saw deer skulls and such, and then I saw something familiar. I walked over to the pile. The bones were a mix of old bleached bones and some fresher, meaning they still had bits of flesh on them. I knelt down and pushed aside a pile of rib and leg bones, and there I saw what was familiar. It was a human skull. It was buried under some dirt but not so much I couldn't tell what I was looking at. I recoiled and stood. The hairs on my neck stood up. Was this proof Sasquatch ate humans? I think it was. I lifted my camera to snap a shot when a loud wood knock sounded further downhill. I looked over my shoulder but didn't see anything. I again lifted my camera, but once more didn't get the shot when a howl sounded from the same place that the knock came from. It was the big guy for sure, and maybe he was warning me about what I was about to do. I wanted to get out of there like no one's business, but I wasn't going to leave without getting a picture. I lifted the camera up snapped a series of shots, turned and raced back up the hill towards my sight. The wood knocks increased, followed by more howls. I was scared now, like really freaking scared. I reached my campsite, exhausted and breathing heavy. A loud crash sounded about a hundred yards or so down the slope from where I came. I looked back and saw a pretty darn good-sized tree waving like it was a twig. That was it. I was terrified for my life. I set my camera down and decided I had gotten all I had thought on the trip and there was no need for me to stay any longer. I began to pack. The wood knocks continued, this time closer. I managed to break my tent down and was folding it up when a shriek from just outside the campsite made me jump. A shiver went down my spine. I jumped to my feet and looked around. Nothing. I saw nothing. I went back to packing, but was disturbed when a large rock came into the camp and landed on the flattened tent. I stared at it. That rock had just been held by a Sasquatch, which was just feet away more than likely. I'd seen enough and now didn't care about my stuff. 
I got up and started walking out. All I remember next is I was just walking out of the campsite when I felt a pain in my head. And the next thing I knew, I was out. I came to what was hours later, I'm guessing, but the sun being low in the sky. I looked up, bit out some dirt in my mouth and touched my head where I'd been hit. My fingers had blood on them. The rock had hit me near my left temple. I rolled over and looked back toward the campsite to see it had been completely thrashed. The tent and backpack were shredded. I wearily got to my feet and walked over to find the camera had been smashed against a rock. I still had the presence of mind to grab some water before I raced out of there. I spent the next few hours getting far enough away before sleeping, my back against a large tree. I woke at sunrise, no surprise, and made the rest of the trek back to my car without issue. I went from there to the local police department to report the skull. All was going fine until I mentioned Sasquatch. I saw the pen slow and the eyes roll. I begged for them to take me seriously, but they gave me lip service, said they'd check it out, and told me to move on. I know they never checked it out because they never asked where I was specifically. Knowing they had ignored me, I went to a large Bigfoot organization I won't name and reported it. I also got snubbed. I know what I saw. I know it was a human skull. I don't know if the creature had killed someone or not, or had simply found a dead body and consumed it. I've been tempted to go back to that site, but when I start to get serious in my planning, I stop. I think the creature let me leave, but next time it may not. On to the next one. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstoriesubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. At the Nevada test site in Nye County in Nevada, a workman, whilst driving in the desolate nuclear testing ground, saw a dark-haired, Six to seven foot tall Bigfoot walk across the road and into sagebrush. No tracks were found. Is Bigfoot vacationing in the southern Nevada desert? The legendary creature, whose activities are normally confined to the Pacific coast, was sighted by a worker in the Nevada test site 95 miles north of Las Vegas recently. Department of Energy spokesman Dave Jackson said a worker saw the creature walk across the road in the forward area of the test site. It was reported heading east toward Yucca Flat, site of numerous above and below ground nuclear tests. The creature was described as more than six feet tall, covered with hair, and walking upright, taking long strides like a man. Jackson said when the unidentified worker reported the sighting, he took quite a bit of ribbing. Jackson said security officials stationed in Mercury investigated, but were unable to find any footprints or other evidence. On to the next one. I was a reserve deputy sheriff for Story County Sheriff's Office. I was employed by Houston International Mineral Corp. at Gold Hill as their on-site security supervisor. I had worked the day shift. I had ran some kids out of the old mill at around 3.30 p.m. I was showing my swing shift officer the area I had run the kids off from. We were in the security vehicle parked on the high side of the south side of the old mill for gold mining. We saw that the boys, four of them, were running back down the ravine to the creek. It was 4.15 p.m. As the boys reached the creek, they must have scared a group of girls at the creek bottom because they started screaming. There was a lot of noise being made by both the girls and the boys laughing and yelling. 
At first, I thought they had scared a deer west of them near the rock outcrop. Then I thought, no, it's too big to be a deer. I could see it moving among the trees, heading up the other side of the ravine at a very fast pace. I thought it must be a lone Mustang as I watched. My security officer got the binoculars from the seat and said, Oh my God. I looked closer and realized it was not a Mustang. I was looking at a large, graying, brown, man-shaped thing about ten plus feet tall. It was obviously male because of its build. As it cleared the trees near the top of the hill, I could clearly see it. It was covered with hair from head to toe, graying like a person in their fifties, and was at least three feet across at the shoulders. At the crest of the hill, it turned to look back down the ravine. It was maybe a hundred yards across the ravine. I had an unobstructed view at this point. It stood on the hilltop maybe a minute, looking back down the hill, then turned and moved over the other side of the hill out of view. We drove over to where we had seen this thing last, about a two-mile drive on a dirt road. It was about 4.50 by then. We saw no further sign of it, but were able to establish that the thing was standing next to a tree that was 11 feet tall, and it was just as tall as the tree we saw. The only other thing that I noticed was just the noise of the kid down lower on the creek. Happy sounds, not fear, screaming and yelling. It was 4.15 p.m., broad daylight, clear skies, warm, almost hot. The area is high desert across the ravine 60 feet deep, with rock outcrop on the other side, with a creek in the bottom of the ravine. There are cottonwood trees and willows in the bottom of the ravine, with juniper, sage, and pine trees on both sides of the ravine. This opens up into a flat as you move west. The siding was just south of the old American flat mill site below the new mill and mill pond. On to the next one. My name is Johnny and I own a ski shop in a small mountain town in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado. I like to be outdoors, and I particularly like to climb mountains. Used to, anyway, before I wrecked my knees climbing and skiing, and had a huge paradigm shift. Let me explain what I mean by that. One day, I set out to climb Red Cloud Peak, 14,034 feet, in the San Juan Mountains. It was late summer, the deadly monsoon season. The San Juans are full of iron ore and attract lightning like no other mountains in Colorado. And the monsoons of late summer bring perfect lightning conditions. Getting an early start, I headed out from the tiny town of Lake City, I'd been told that the Red Cloud Trailhead was on the road to Cinnamon Pass, which I'd never been on, though later I would have a number of adventures there. Having grown up in Colorado, to me a mountain path is simply any road that goes over a mountain. So I left Lake City and took the first road that looked like it went over a mountain, not realizing that I'd inadvertently taken the wrong fork in the road. I'm not the bravest of high-altitude drivers, and it still amazes me that I did this. Just took off upward and onward. I could see a single track going up a very steep mountain, but I couldn't see where it actually went. After climbing a few hundred feet, I was soon at a scree field. The road now just a faint flatness across what looked like a 45-degree slope a very loose rock, and I could now see it ended high above at an old abandoned mine. The rocks were beginning to settle under my jeep, and since there was no place to turn around, I slowly, very slowly, backed down the road, narrow and steep, hoping I could stay on track. That should have been my first sign that maybe it was a good day to go home and read a book or go shopping 
or whatever people do who don't go adventuring outdoors. When I got back down, I rechecked my map. It had led me astray, and not for the first time. Once back down off the scree field, I recoinitered carefully, studying the map, not wanting more of that kind of adventure, but there was more to come, unbeknownst to me. In fact, it would be a day that would test my commitment to life, but in a slow, steady way, kind of like backing off that mountain. It would also test my commitment to reality. I eventually found the right road and continued on to the base of the peak. Red Cloud is not a particularly difficult peak as peaks go, but all Colorado peaks require stamina and being in good shape, and you can die on any of them if things are just right, or wrong, I should say. The Silver Creek route up Red Cloud follows the creek for a few miles, then veers off into the flank of the big peak into Tundra, and eventually on up the summit. It's a pleasant hike up the creek, and the climbing actually begins in earnest after leaving the drainage. It's about nine miles round trip with an elevation gain of 3,700 feet. Because of my false start, it was now getting late, only about an hour before noon, which is when one should actually be on top of the peak not starting out, for the monsoons can carry you off the top if you're there when they come in, and they almost always come in. The sky was clear, though I know how quickly clouds can form in these mountains, but I started out anyway. I could turn around if things got bad, no problem, but I had seriously discounted one factor, my own tendency to be compulsive. My day pack had water, a jacket, and gorp. I hiked quickly, strong, to the base of the peak, the altitude making me somewhat lightheaded. On and on, through stands of willows, through fields of boulders, until I could see the ridge high above that led to the final summit. I had to stop often to catch my breath. Clouds were forming, but didn't look too serious. I continued on. I finally reached a small saddle, and by now, the winds were whipping around me. Thendrils of clouds moved in, and the temperature dropped. I climbed upward, upward, as it became darker and darker, and by now, it was early afternoon. I stopped to catch my breath again. The snows began. I heard a rock slide above me, but couldn't see anything and it soon quieted. Now, eating gorp, drinking water, I could feel my strength go, and I had to now decide whether or not to continue. I had put on my somewhat light jacket, but was getting chilled anyway. The prudent part of me said to turn around, but the compulsive part said go on. So much effort, so near the top, the urge to continue is strong in a situation like this. You have so much already invested. Decisions often aren't prudent, especially if you're pushed by determination. I decided to summit. My decision was accompanied by even darker clouds and an immense sense of urgency, dread, and deadly compulsion. Later, my brother told me of climbing the same peak and rescuing a climber who was hypothermic and had no idea who he was or even where he was, and who was thinking about going back up instead of down. It wasn't long till I was on the top, but there was no reward, no view, except that of swirling snow and black clouds. I'd never felt more alone in my life. I wanted to stop, to sit, like I always did on top, but the sense of urgency wouldn't go away. It was now even stronger. Retreat quickly, it said. The wind began to howl. It was a long hike back, as the altitude and the effort had taken its toll. 
The retreat down became a test of willpower, and now I began to shiver. Hypothermia set in, the biggest killer in the mountain, and I hadn't come prepared with enough warm clothes in what could be a fatal error, especially when hiking alone. I continued to eat gorp on the way down for energy, but I was failing and becoming fatigued beyond what I should be, and my core body temperature was dropping. My legs felt like lead, and I wanted more than anything to stop and rest and take a quick nap. I knew I had to continue. By now, I was running only on determination. I had heard the many stories. I knew how easy it was to die like this. Snow swirled around me, and it was nearly dark. Not from sunset, but from the thick black cloud. I began to lose my sense of who I was, and where I was, and why I was there. For a bit, I thought I was being followed by a cougar, but it soon melted into the swirling snow. I stumbled on and thought my brother was with me, and began talking to him, but somehow, deep within, I knew this wasn't right, that I had to keep going, that something was very wrong. I felt dizzy and stopped for a bit, leaning against a tall pine, wanting nothing more than to sit down and take a nap. I was overwhelmingly sleepy from the hypothermia and altitude. Finally, I sat down. I just wanted to take a quick nap, and then I'd get up and continue on. The last thing I remember was how quiet the snow seemed to fall how quickly it was changing the color of my jacket from blue to white. When I woke again, I felt very strange. I had no idea how long I'd slept, and I also had no idea where I was. I'm not even sure I even knew who I was. My toes and fingertips were numb, and the edges of my ears had a strange burning sensation. I remember a strange, musky odor, I thought I was sitting in a rocking chair and tried to stand up, but couldn't, and it was then that I realized I was being carried. I finally regained some sense and remembered who I was and what I was doing there. Someone had found me and was carrying me. It felt like I was thrown over someone's shoulder, and this seemed odd to me, but then I thought, well, how else would you carry someone? I tried to talk asking, who are you, and received no reply. We just continued on down the trail. I recall feeling very warm, where I was in contact with this person, and I thought they must have a high metabolism to have such body heat. It helped warm me up a lot. It felt like they were almost burning hot. As I became more aware of my senses, I realized that whoever was carrying me was quite large, and the ground wasn't very close below me. It was then that I really paid attention, and looking down the backside of whoever it was, I noted they were indeed big. I could see the huge muscles in their legs moving as they walked, and they didn't seem to have any trouble at all carrying me, and I'm six feet and weigh a good 200 pounds. Things began to dawn on me very slowly, maybe because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This person wore no clothes, was covered in dark brown hair, and was barefoot. I could make out their tracks behind us, and they were huge, at least twice what mine would have been pushing deep through the snow, which was now a good six inches deep and pressing on into the ground beneath. I now began to question my sanity. I must be dreaming. How could something like this be? I'd heard of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but it was a myth, a legend, and not in Colorado, but rather in the Northwest like Oregon and Washington. Strangely enough, this allowed me to relax. It was just a dream, and maybe I was even dying. The brain did strange things when it's freezing, so I imagined anyway. But all of a sudden, my survival instinct kicked in. I didn't want to die. I had people I cared about 
and things I needed to do. I couldn't just passively let myself die out here. I had to pull myself out of this hallucination and come back to reality. I needed desperately to get back to my Jeep and get warm. I started yelling and kicking and tried to twist myself loose. Next thing I remember, I was being gently placed onto the ground. I lay there for a moment, afraid to look up. What if this wasn't a dream? When I finally opened my eyes, I saw I was on the ground next to my Jeep. I slowly pulled myself up and looked around. There was nothing there. Nothing out of the ordinary, just me and my Jeep. I fumbled with my pack, which was still on my back, and I found my keys. I'll never forget how difficult those last few steps were. It was all I could do to unlock the door, get in, start it up, turn on the heater, soak in the heat. It felt as hard as climbing that entire mountain had been. I finally relaxed, favoring the warmth, still wanting to sleep, but the snow was still coming down, and I now began to worry about getting stuck. I had to get out of there. Was it a dream? A hallucination? I had to make one last attempt at making sense of it all. So I opened the car door and looked out, but nothing was there, just swirling snow. I was too weak to get out and look around for footprint. Plus, I was totally weirded out at that point and half terrified. I grabbed a sack from the passenger side that contained what was going to be my dinner. Bread, lunch meat, apples, and some cheese. I took the sack and placed it outside next to the car. If the creature was real, I owed it my life. I yelled out, thank you. I knew at this point I must be crazy, throwing away my only food and yelling into the storm. What if I got stuck and needed that food? The sense of urgency was now even greater, so I drove away, half numb, but coherent enough to make it on down to Lake City. In town, the sun was shining, the sky blue, but the mountains behind were gone, hidden in some black clouds. I later heard that San Juan got over two feet of snow that day, and on through the night, the storm raging in an anger that seemed malevolent. I had a fierce headache for two long days. My ears, toes, and fingertips suffered light frostbite. But what suffered most of all was my idea of what made up the natural world. In fact, that's never recovered. I know that creature saved my life if it was a real thing and not a hallucination. But I'm still afraid now to go out into the woods alone, though I'm okay with others around. I went to my cousin's house in Lake City and then to the doctor, where I was treated and released. She believed my story, though I didn't tell her for several days. The next summer, we decided to go back up there to get some closure. When I got out of the car, it was a beautiful, sunny day, but I still flashed back to that snowy day. It felt like I was back in the storm, and I kind of panicked. She put her arms around me and just held me while I cried, and I'm a grown man. Was it a dream? I'll never know for sure, but I believe it wasn't based on the musky smell of my clothes and, more convincingly, on a small bit of dark hair that had caught in the zipper of my pack where the animal was carrying me. I've placed this in a small bag, and in a weird way, it's kind of like a treasure, for it helped me to remember that there are other intelligent, caring animals on this big planet. God bless that creature, whatever it was, for it saved my life that day. On to the next one. In Abington, in Plymouth County, in Massachusetts, 25 years ago, I heard the most awful and terrifying screams for three nights in a row. We had just built a two-story addition, which is situated further back on a lot, about 150 feet into the woods from the street. This area was considered suburban, but was fairly rural at the time. 
There are houses built along the street that are on lots of three quarters to one acre. We own several acres of heavily wooded land and our house sits back on the lot further than the others. The section of wood is bordered by three state highways and was about one mile length by one and a half miles width of the woods and some farmland fields. At the time, there were only two dead-end streets that penetrated this section of the wood. Another country road separates this section on the west with a state park nearby, a quarter of a mile from the road. This park is several hundred acres of lakes and heavily wooded area. The area is now filled with housing and development. It was July and was very hot, over 90 degrees and the peepers were very loud. Each evening between 2 and 3.30 a.m., an extremely loud, howling, screaming sound would start far away. As it came closer, the screams lasted for 20 to 30 seconds each and occurred every one to two minutes or so. You could hear bushes and branches being swept out of the way with loud crunching and breaking sounds and the screams would get louder in intensity. The woods at that time were covered with thick vines and brambles that were three to five feet high. It was extremely difficult to walk through any section of the woods that was not cleared. You just didn't stroll through the woods, especially in the pitch black. When this thing came closer, all the peepers and the night sounds completely ceased. The sound was so loud in volume that it actually caused you to freeze. I mean that it ran your blood cold. I remember laying in bed not wanting to investigate because whatever it was, it was big, and I did not want to find out what it was. It was not the sound of a bear, a mountain lion, or a wounded deer. The sound had a human quality about it, and it was like it was searching for something, and had a sense of pain or distress about it. It would travel parallel through the woods about a hundred feet behind my house. On the third night, I got up immediately and waited for this thing to get closer. I have a switch in the bedroom that would turn on some roof-mounted floodlight that would shine in the backyard. We did not have a deck or anything at the time, and the woods were about twenty-five feet behind the house this thing was crashing through the woods, and when it was right behind the house, it gave out this huge, loud moan. I was looking out the window with all the inside lights out, and then I turned on the floodlight. The scream stopped, and there was silence for about five seconds, and then it crashed through the woods away from the house, very quickly, opposite the direction it came from. You could hear the crashing of a two-footed creature. I heard the crashing sound for about another minute, and then it faded and was quiet. I was really spooked and went downstairs and started turning on all the lights and the outside lights. I noticed that all my neighbors were turning on their outside lights as well. This was unreal because no one left outside lights on and there was no street lights in this section of the street. There were at least four other houses that turned their lights on. I contemplated whether to call the police, but did not. The next day, while I mowed the lawn, my elderly neighbor across the street from me came over and said, Dave, did you hear those sounds last night? I've heard them for several nights and almost called the cops. If I hear it again, I'm calling the police. I've never heard anything like that in my life. I agreed and it was good that someone else confirmed the incident to me. All these years, and I've only told close friends of the story, and the kidding I take is unmerciful, but I know to this day what I heard was absolutely real. I forgot about it for many years until I saw some Bigfoot documentary. They played a recording, and when I heard it, it brought back the whole incident it was almost identical to the sound. I've played the sound recording on various websites and would say it was pretty close to the Ohio or Pennsylvania recordings. I never heard anything after those nights, 
I did not see anything. Perhaps others have given reports from this area, and this might be helpful. I'm being truthful about this. I do not drink or do any non-prescription drugs. I am a church administrator in a Bible non-denominational church. I do recall now and then reading some accounts about a path deep in the woods about a mile long that ran parallel to the house. It was about 500 feet back of my house along an old stone wall that was covered by a canopy of trees and very dark even on bright days. I would occasionally walk through the woods and found this path. The entrance was through the woods about a quarter of a mile down the street and through a dense pine grove. You would enter an open field and then enter this dark section of wood. I found an irregular path that rambled, but always wondered why there were many broken branches and small trees and closed in areas, like small trees pulled together and the rocks in the wall would be all over the place. Some of them were a good size. I always thought that maybe some kids used this path to school or built forts or something, but I now realize it was too dense and not really in the right direction to the schools. I never heard any kids out back in all the years I have been here. My wife was awakened by the sound, but does not clearly recall it now. The sighting was around 2 to 3.30 a.m. in the morning, hot and humid on a clear night. No lights from any direction, pitch black. The area was a suburban town of about 10,000 people, but large areas of wood and farms in this area at the time. Wooded areas of hardwood and pine trees with thick undergrowth of vine. On to the next one. I was a raft guide at the time, working what called the Daily out of Moab, Utah a very popular run on the Colorado River. It's tourist intensive, and I was feeling burned out and had two weeks off, so I decided to solo canoe the Green, one of my favorite things to do. The Green River has a long stretch between the town of Green River, Utah, and where it meets the Colorado at the confluence. This is a very mellow run and popular with canoeists because there are no rapids. It's made of two lengths called Labyrinth and Dillwater Canyon. It can take a good week to 10 days to run both, about 120 miles. And I made arrangement with a jet boat company to pick me up on day 10 at the confluence, which is standard operating procedure. You can't canoe below the confluence because of the rapid in Cataract Canyon. A friend dropped me and my canoe off, and I put in early the morning at Green River Geyser, a few miles out of town. I immediately felt the scent of peace that always comes to me when solo canoeing in Big Desert Canyon. The river was slow and mellow, and I could immediately feel all my tensions melting away. That first day, I saw only a couple of other boats, both being small, non-commercial rafts. I spent the night on a large sandbar that I'd camped on before. I watched a spectacular sunset and played my Peruvian flute into the evening. The next day, I was dilly-dallying, drinking coffee, and lazing around camp, hanging out on the beach as I was finally getting ready to take off. A small raft with two people came drifting along, and they stopped, pulling the raft up onto the beach. They seemed disturbed and asked me if I heard the weird noises the previous night. They had apparently camped about two miles above me. I told them I hadn't, and they said some large animal had been up on the rim screaming at them. It didn't sound like a mountain lion and had really scared them so much so that they were now going to take out early at Mineral Bottom instead of going all the way to the confluence. Mineral Bottom is where Labyrinth Canyon ends and Stillwater begins, but they were still a good two to three days away from it. This animal had screamed at them most of the night, they told me, and 
sounded very big and angry. They expressed concern for my traveling solo, offering to let me tag along with them. In fact, they almost begged me to tag along, and I felt their concerns were genuine. But I shrugged the whole affair off as being a mountain lion and forgot about it not long after they were gone. There's not much out in the canyons that scares me. I've spent my entire life in that country, and I know its flora and fauna like the back of my hand. I've hiked it, dirt biked it, flown over it, and jeeped it. I had a wonderful day and slept well on the beach that night, entranced by the desert stars. The green was my second home, and I loved being out there. The third day went well until mid to late afternoon when I noticed that the river was rising. I paid attention, but didn't worry. It must be raining somewhere upstream. It could be miles and miles away, but by evening, I was having trouble locating a good place to camp as the river had risen enough that the beaches were being inundated. Now it was getting late, and I was becoming a bit worried. The river had risen enough that everything looked different. I couldn't find the camp spot I wanted, one I'd camped at, on another trip. I kept floating and looking, and by the time it was almost dark, I decided to boat over into a cottonwood grove that was partially underwater and tie up to one of the trees. I left lots of rope length in case the river kept rising so I wouldn't get in trouble and be pulled under ate a quick cold dinner and tried to create a makeshift bed in the canoe, which was pretty difficult, but the water soon lulled me to sleep, as I was really tired. I'd been on the river all day, with no real break. This was my third day on the river, and I knew I was getting close to Mineral Bottom, as the river had been running high and fast, and it typically takes about four or five days to get there. Mineral Bottom has a place for takeout and an access road such that it is dropping off the island in the sky and a bit hairy. I don't know what time it was when I woke up. My senses heightened by the rising river. I checked the rope with my flashlight. All was well. The river seemed to have stopped rising. I had drifted back to sleep, somewhat uncomfortable, when I heard something whoosh in the river not far from my canoe. It was odd. It sounded like a large rock dropping into the water. I thought about it and listened for a while, then decided it was a beaver flapping its tail. Beavers are nocturnal, as beavers tend to stay near the smaller estuaries where they have their dam. I drifted off and again woke to the sound, only closer. That was followed by another, and then a large rock that landed in the water close enough that it sprayed me. I was being barraged by someone. I turned on my flashlight and shone it around, seeing no one, then pulled my watch from my pack. It was 5 a.m. At that point, what must have been a huge rock nicked the side of my canoe, causing it to tip a bit, and I could even hear a little wood splintering. Whoever had thrown the rock had possibly seen my light and location. I was now both scared and mad, and I started yelling and cussing at whoever was doing this to cut it out. This was followed by a pause, and then another rock thrown close to the canoe. These rocks seemed like they were very large from the splashes they made. I now figured I had two choices. Stay put and get maimed, killed, or sunk by a rock, or get away. I fumbled with the rope afraid to use the flashlight to see what I was doing, and eventually got the canoe free as more rocks came in. I pulled out into the current in the dark, immediately heard a sound from the rim high above, a sound I will never forget, one I've never heard before. It started out as a very loud and deep growling and soon turned into a high-pitched, undulating scream echoing through the canyon. I've never heard anything so loud and massive. It had to come from a very large creature. It was so powerful, it had an almost electrical component to it, with multiple frequencies. 
It made my blood run cold and scared me almost to death. The rim was probably a good 1,000 feet above me. So I felt I would be safe out on the river, and I started trying to read the current in the early dawn, an impossible task. The river had risen enough that I wasn't afraid as much of running into a sandbar as being overrun by a large log or branch, but I managed to stay afloat as dawn gradually made my surroundings visible. The river had gone down some. I stayed out in the middle, away from the rim, where the weird stuff had happened to my right. As the day became lighter and things more visible, I could make out someone running on the rim, keeping up with me, though high above and some distance away. Whoever or whatever it was, it was fast. This really scared me, that someone would do this, but I knew they had no chance of coming off that rim. It was just too sheer and high. They were so high up, I could barely make out a figure on the skyline. It's hard to express what I was feeling as it became late morning, and by now this had been going on for several hours, the figure following along on the rim. It now occurred to me that there are places where one can come down off the rim, and I was in a heightened state of fear and flight. A sustained adrenaline flow that was making me more tense and nearly physically sick by the moment. I hadn't eaten anything since the light dinner the evening before, and I knew I couldn't keep anything down anyway. I was also in a state of disbelief. The green had always been my sanctuary and refuge. I was beginning to think I was going mad, except I kept thinking of the rafters who had stopped and of the report. Whatever this thing was, it had incredible endurance and speed to keep up with me like it was. As I estimated, I was moving a good six or seven miles per hour on the river. By now, I was rowing as fast as possible, just focusing on getting to Mineral Bottom. I knew I was almost to Bonot Bend, and it would be about a mile from the takeout once I exited the loop. I entered the mender and looked up but there was nothing on the rim. It must have given up. But soon, to my horror, I noticed a large, man-like creature, all dark brown, swimming in the current behind me and to my right. And I watched in disbelief as it slowly gained on me. It must have been huge and very powerful to make headway like that, as I was in the direct river current, which was relatively swift from yesterday's storm. I was beginning to think I was hallucinating. I rode even harder, scared beyond words. I could make out its arms, which seemed to be very long and powerful, and its head was huge. Its shoulders were massive and very muscular as they pulled it through the water. What I could see was totally covered with dark hair or fur, except for around its facial features, where there appeared to be a lighter skin. I couldn't really see it that well through the water being flung up by its powerful stroke, but it reminded me of a cross between a giant ape and a human. It was totally unreal. Soon, I was at Mineral Bottom, and I've never felt such a sense of relief. The creature was still behind me, but as I rode to the banks of the river, hoping and praying that someone was there, it seemed to fall back. If no one was there, I had no idea what would happen. My prayers were answered as I jumped out of the canoe as I saw a raft group putting into do still water. I could barely talk, but asked if I could get a ride out with the driver as I was sick, and they said that would be fine. I was shaking and felt like I would pass out, but managed to keep it together. I wanted to tell them not to get in the water, but I decided with that many people they would be okay, and I knew they would think I was crazy so I didn't say anything. We loaded my canoe into their trailer, but I didn't even care what happened to it. I knew I would never use it again. In fact, I ended up giving it to a friend. I wanted nothing to do with it. He was incredulous when I told him the story, but I told him I was moving away and I would never use it again, and he seemed to accept that. I haven't been on a river since. And I quit my job and moved to Colorado, where I work as a carpenter. 
I will never go into the canyons again. I feel like I've lost a very important part of my life. But it's just how it is. I've seen several therapists, and none understand. But they all tell me I have symptoms of PTSD. Not long after this, against my advice, my friend went down labyrinth in my canoe. I literally begged him not to, and regretted giving it to him. He woke up one morning to find the canoe missing, even though he carefully tied it off. He had to hitch a ride with some rafters, and they found the canoe a few miles downstream on a beach, smashed to smithereens. This was a valuable craft, a genuine, handmade red cedar canoe from Maine, and no one in their right mind would have destroyed it. My friend said he found several huge, human-like footprints next to the boat in the sand, I know exactly what did the damage, and I also know it probably was capable of doing it with its bare hand. Why it didn't harm my friend, I don't know, but maybe it was just angry at people in general. I never saw the creature again, though I hear it scream many times in my nightmares. On to the next one. In Manistee County in Michigan, my dad and I had just got set up to start deer hunting. I had a ways to walk further south than he had to. I saw his flashlight bobbing in the woods to my right, to the south, as I headed to my blind. He got into position and kicked up something that smelled awful. This thing was crashing through the woods like a freight train. It was too loud to be a deer as it crashed right by me in the dark, smelling awful. I didn't know what it was, but was frightened sitting there in the dark until it got light out. The smell was awful that morning. I was hunting with my dad. It smelled like a dog that rolled in something bad. It was a real crisp, cool morning, and I could hear and smell a lot. It was very noticeable. The next fall, during small game season, my friend and I were hunting grouse in the same area when we happened upon a track near the road that was much larger than my size 12 boot. It was like a large human-like footprint that headed towards the road that led to the weir. We looked for more and located the more that crossed the road toward the little Mantisy River. In this area, there had been some unusual sightings and sounds by many fly fishermen namely seeing large black objects watching them, then moving away, generally interpreted as black bear. Not unlikely, but not on two feet. Well, I was working with a guy at Filler City Mill of Packaging Corporation of America who confirmed a similar sighting near that area. It is an area of heavy deciduous forest, swampy cedar swamp, and pine forest. On to the next one. This was in Grand Traverse County in Michigan. In February, I was wandering around an old junkyard with my best friend and three others, one girl and two other boys. My friend and I were both 14 at the time. The ages of the other kids ranged from 11 to 13. The junkyard was an open area that was surrounded by a house and wood to the west, a rarely used railroad to the north, another house and Riley Road to the south, and a very dense swamp to the east. I should note that the two houses were not easily visible from the junkyard. They were about a hundred yards or more away. The junkyard was closest to the railroad and the swamp. The entire surrounding area was very sparsely populated, mostly wood and swamp. The junkyard was filled with old appliances, TVs, ovens, dryers, and furniture, as well as old magazines. My friend and I had happened to find an old issue of Penthouse without the other seeing us, so we decided to go off and find a secret hiding place for our discovery. We headed off toward the woods and swamp to the east. We were just inside the woods near the swamp, and we stopped to survey the immediate area for a good hiding place. I glanced down at the snow-covered ground 
near my friend's foot, and immediately all the hair on my head and neck stood at attention. Right there, just inches from his boot, was an incredibly huge human-looking footprint. It was pristine. It was very fresh. It was about 18 inches long. The track looked completely normal except for its size. Five toes, ball, arch, heel, just like a bare footprint would look in the sand on the beach, except this one was in frozen snow. And it was about half to three quarters of an inch deep. Mine and my friend's tracks were barely visible, only a couple of millimeters deep. We each weighed about 150 to 160 pounds. It was a right foot, and there were no claw marks whatsoever ahead of any of the five toes as a bear track would exhibit. The ground around the track was patchy with frozen snow. There had been a thaw a few days ago, but now the weather had turned very cold again, but with no new snow, and the bare ground was quite frozen. I was quite knowledgeable, even at only 14 years old. I knew what to look for to determine a track's validity. I spent the better part of my childhood in the woods, playing, hiking, exploring. I knew the difference between fresh track and one that had been distorted for melting. This one was definitely fresh. We looked for more tracks, but only found one other about ten feet away, closer to the railroad. It was just outside the edge of the wood, also in snow, and also a right foot. It was also about 18 inches in length. I also remember looking for hair samples, but to no avail. To this day, I am still puzzled as to why we did not find any tracks of the left foot, and only found two tracks at that. The ground was frozen, and the snow-covered area were sparse near and in the swamp. It looked as if something or somebody came out of the swamp, heading east and then turned, heading back into the swamp. We searched the surrounding area for more tracks, including several hundred yards of snow near the swamp's edge to the east and to the south, but found nothing. I really wanted to go into the swamp to look for more tracks, but it was nearly impenetrable. The swamp was filled with downed trees and overturned stumps. It seemed to me that we could only follow these tracks if we were either very tiny, like a squirrel, or very tall, say eight to nine feet, and very strong. We eventually gave up after several hours and headed back to my friend's house, which was about a half a mile to the west. We told the others not to tell the adults as they would not believe us. Sure enough, neither set the parents believed that we had encountered anything extraordinary and did not want to be bothered with such nonsense. We never collected any evidence from that site, photographic or otherwise. To this day, I have never returned. I had heard strange things going on in the area around the Interlochen Golf Course, which is about one to two miles to the north-northwest of where we found the track, but nothing really concrete, just vague stories of weird things happening. It was early afternoon, mostly cloudy, and about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. On to the next one. At Lake Ellen Baptist Camp on Crystal Lake in Dickinson County in Michigan, two other kids and I saw tracks in mud on Old Two Track. They were big and especially wide and only had three toes. There were probably seven steps that we could see clearly. My friend and I thought this was probably a hoax, since it was a summer camp and everyone there liked to pull pranks. That night, one of the same kids was with me, and we knocked on one of the other cabin doors. Before they could answer, we ran and hid on the two-track where we had found the track. Off to the left, I heard a low growl. My friend heard it too, and we ran back to the cabin. We went to bed and planned to go out to look for whatever had made the tracks and the noise. I waited for everyone to go to sleep, and while I waited, I heard what sounded like a woman screaming. It was a scary sound. It was like someone scared a woman and she screamed, but without being hysterical. 
It wasn't like a panicky scream. Anyway, it was an all-boys camp and all-male counselors. Some of the cooks were women, and also the main preacher guy had his wife there. Oh, the sound also came from roughly the same place as the growls and the tracks. I was in fifth grade then. Neither me nor the other kid have said anything since then, unless we were joking around. Nobody would have believed us from the camp. And that night, it rained, so the tracks were washed out. I went back to the camp for a few more years, and always hoped to find something to prove what I saw, and heard was real, and not just an imaginative kid. The tracks might have been someone walking barefoot and expanded by the drying mud, but I could swear that it had three toes, and the steps were really far apart. It was slightly downhill, and if I ran and jumped, I could land with each step, and I was about five foot six. My friends and I were just going for a hike in the woods when we stumbled onto the tracks, just exploring, I guess. Then, for the growl, we had to sort of put the tracks out of our mind, and were hiding after a prank, knocking on the next cabin door. Then, I was waiting for everyone to fall asleep when I heard the scream. And unfortunately, everyone was asleep, so no one else heard it. The whole area is quite swampy, but the tracks we could see were on a two-track that led around the lake. There were cabins, like 50 or 75 feet away from the tracks, but the camp is empty for all but a few months of the year. The tracks went into the woods, and there was a deer trail nearby. The two-track was on a decline because of a hill. The further down the hill, the more wet and swampy it becomes. When I heard the scream, I was in the cabin closest to the woods. The growl came from 10 to 15 feet away from the very edge of the two-track, and there was thick brush between myself and the origin of the sound. On to the next one. A hunting camp in the Sierra Nevada mountain was made famous by the so-called Sierra Sound, recorded by Ron Moorhead and Alan Berry. In the early 1970s, Moorhead, Berry, and a small group of other men heard and recorded something, presumably Bigfoot, emitting a series of strange chants, chatters, growls, and guttural utterances. These voices occasionally appear and reply and interact with campers. The Sierra Camp, as the site became known, was home to years of Bigfoot encounters and evidence in the form of tracks. Disturbances around the camp, recorded vocalizations, and rare fleeting glimpses of Sasquatch creatures. The Bigfoot, however, were not the only strange things encountered near the Sierra Camp. One night in August of 1974, campers witnessed a bizarre light. One of the men at the camp, a Lewis Johnston, announced, there's something funny going on because there was a bright flash from up there that just lit up the whole area. Johnson's brother, Warren, emerged from the shelter just in time to see another flash. It was just like a strobe light, he noted. It lit up the whole camp scene. The light, according to Warren, seemed to originate around 15 feet above the ground and 30 feet away in the tree. He continued, To me, it seemed like the light source or whatever was round and ball-like, maybe two to three feet in diameter. And it had a bluish cast and a white band around it. The flash was not accompanied by a sound, and, curiously, though it lit up the entire campsite, it did not affect Warren's night vision or blind him, even momentarily. A third flash diffused a greenish light, which briefly illuminated an area nearly 100 feet in diameter. Warren said it exploded from a different area than the previous flashes. The campers watched in amazement as more flashes fired off in the trees around them. Warren started timing the silent explosions 
estimating they occurred at two-minute intervals. I walked up to the shelter and back, he noted, and it seemed like every six to eight feet a light would explode somewhere in the trees overhead. The men realized their shuffling feet in the pine mat covering the ground seemed to somehow activate these lights flashing. The proposal that static electricity could have somehow caused the flashes was dispelled by weather conditions which were not conductive to such a hypothesis. The men also noticed a high-pitched whining noise in the area where they were standing watching the lights. The lights eventually tapered off around midnight, and the campers went to sleep inside the primitive Sierra Camp shelter. Just after 3 a.m., Warren woke to the sound of a mouse scampering near his head. Warren swatted the rodent. I nailed him with the palm of my hand and must have knocked him clear across the shelter, he said. What happened, though, was just as I hit him, almost simultaneously, a light flashed inside the shelter right by the door. The flash was bright enough to wake two of the other men who witnessed with Warren in rapid succession, maybe a second or two apart, five or six more, all intensively bright green flashes. Then they stopped, and we saw nothing more. We shined our flashlights around everywhere, but couldn't find anything, and there was no sound, nothing at all. The next night, the light flashes occurred again, similar to the previous evening, the third night, the light intensified and seemed to congregate on the men at the camp. They flashed over their heads and seemed to follow them, lighting the area up like daylight with each silent burst. The following morning, the men discovered a Bigfoot trackway, which, like so many others, ended mysteriously. The last track was in the middle of a wide swath of soft, mushy ground with no indication of where the next track landed, even accounting for the creature's great stride. This flashing green light, as reported at the Sierra Camp, is repeated in other Bigfoot encounters. In 2012, Greg and Dana Newkirk, paranormal investigators and owners of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult, met with Dallas Gilbert and Wayne Burton. The two men had reputations as Bigfoot researchers with an unusual approach to the mystery. In fact, Gilbert and Burton were treated as pariahs by many in the Bigfoot community. Few of their colleagues had patience for their tales of portals to prehistoric worlds, dimension-jumping Bigfoot, and telepathic Sasquatch. Bigfoot researchers risked their reputation in the community by even associating with Gilbert and Burton. And yet, many did take the risk, for despite their crazy theories, Gilbert and Burton's secret Bigfoot hotspot, known as the Boneyard, produced multiple recordings of unidentified vocalizations and sometimes even close encounters with Bigfoot creatures. The Newkirks accompanied Gilbert and Burton to the Boneyard, somewhere in the wilds of West Virginia. Gilbert taught Dana a special call, a series of sacred words supposedly in the Bigfoot language. Around the fire that night, Dana issued forth the sacred call. Her words were still echoing through the mountains when a green flash illuminated the sky above. The flash was followed by a loud, booming shriek from the woods first from one side of the campfire, then answered with similar vocalizations from the opposite side. Whatever made the strange cries, there was more than one, and they seemed to be approaching the camp. Though previously somewhat incredulous of Gilbert and Burton's claims, the Newkirks were now faced with the undeniable reality that something was indeed out there, and whatever it was, it seemed to respond to Dana's call. Greg recalled, Frankly, I was terrified. We all were. None of us had heard anything like it before. The howls continued for two hours, 
accompanied by stones thrown into their camp intermittently. On one occasion, something large charged from the tree line, prompting Burton to leap from his chair and run directly at the intruder, which returned from whence it came. Like so many of these weird anomalies associated with Bigfoot, the green flash appears alongside other phenomena. After this night at the boneyard, Greg Newkirk looked deeper into the strange viridian light. The more I dug into the green flash phenomena, the more interesting things got. These mysterious lights popped up in loads of reports connected to everything from ghost sightings to UFO experience to, believe it or not, Bigfoot encounters. Most often, the green flash is reported as an afterthought, as if the primary phenomenon experienced by the witness was so stunning that the flash was nearly forgotten in the commotion. Greg continued, I began to go through my own files, realizing that my old ghost hunting team had reported the mysterious green flash several times, often as a precursor to the paranormal activity. We weren't alone either. Fellow investigators had reported ghosts appearing and disappearing in flashes of emerald light of entire rooms spontaneously illuminated in shades of green and even glowing free-floating globules that appear to have a mind of their own. This phenomena, though, was widely ignored. Green flashes, illuminated eyes of various color, glowing hairy hominid, floating orbs, light in various forms, both surrounding and directly inhabit the Bigfoot mystery, and indeed the whole of the paranormal. Their eye glow may suggest Bigfoot is something other, but these alternate lights embedded within the Bigfoot mystery seem intent on making it more than a suggestion, connecting the creature to other paranormal phenomenon by their visual example, deepening the mystery or perhaps muddying the waters. For as ever with Bigfoot, the more connections we make, the more data we have, we only seem to end up with more questions than answers. Like a silent shadow, Bigfoot ambles off into the darkness of the forest glancing over its shoulder with gleaming eyes, and we are left to wonder at the wild man as generations before us have done. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!